thank you the organization for having me here. I'm very glad to be back in Brazil, not at this time because of our new president, but I mean, yeah, it is what it is. So uh, I know, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm starving, so I'm gonna be super quick because the coffee break is coming. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about, now I have a spoiler, small violations of bell inequalities for multipartite pure random states that was published this year in the Journal of Mathematical Physics and it's a collaboration between me and Rafael Drummond from the Federal University of Minas Gerais and Roberto Imbuzero from the Brazilian Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics, IMPA in Rio de Janeiro. So, and I mean, I have only maybe uh, five or six 10 slides, it's, super, it's gonna be super quick, and this is my main result, is this theorem, give n d m v greater than two integers, let psi belongs to this set, be a unit vector, blah, 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 according to the hard measure in this sphere, blah, 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 then this probability is, is lesser than blah, 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 with this super exponential behavior here for any delta where this v opt that belongs here, that appears here is the soup soup this of this trace and blah 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 okay it's stated like that it stated like that it means nothing right sure and I'm gonna yeah I spend maybe my next six minutes explaining this capital N little d m v uh, this function here why I'm taking the soup of the soup and why I'm using this uh, kind of a functional here, okay? And after that, I will go back to this theorem and I will explain the two main important corollaries cor cor that we can get from this result. So, okay, our scenario is like that. It's a black box scenario composed by N boxes, so capital N, on the top of each box, I have M, little m, buttons. And any time that we push, that we hit one button, one of these light bulbs here will turn on. And I have on the bottom of each box V of these light bulbs. That means N boxes. At the end of the day, I have N capital N boxes. M questions for each boxes in each box on each box in this, in this case, and <coughs> v different pos v different outcomes per measurement per button. So and since this scenario is a kind of a black box scenario, I don't have access to the inner details of each box. So the best that I can do is try to get the statistics that come after bazillion numbers of rounds of press buttons and getting results, press buttons and getting results. So the best thing that I can do is use this condition, this probability of uh, in the, on, on the box one, I press the button X1 and I got the result A1. On the box X, the box two, I press the button, on the box two, sorry, I press the button X2 and I got the result A2 and so on and so forth. So this is the best description that I have for, for this scenario. And even in the simplest scenario, which is two boxes, two buttons, and two outcomes, uh, this probability vector here that we call behavior, this, sorry, this probability here that we call behavior lies in this R V to the M, V times M to the N which is in the simplest scenario, is something like two times two to the n r to 16. So it's huge, the space that we are dealing with. Okay, so let me just for completeness, completeness define uh, our three most important sets. The first one, I say that this probability vector, this behavior, sorry, uh, belongs to the non-signaling set Whenever I can, okay, th there is this ugly mathematics here, but uh, my behavior belongs to the, the non-signaling set whenever I can define uh, marginals for each box. I mean, each box has uh, its own life per se, independent of, it, independent of any other box. This is the non-signaling set. 
And the other set, I'll start defining it, which is the local set, the Bell local set, saying that, okay, it could be the case that all of these boxes are completely independent of each other, and then, of course, this big probability here will be, at the end of the day, only the product of the probability coming from each box. So in this case of that each box, uh, that each box are independent of the other boxes, we have this probability here, this big one, factorizing into this product here coming from each box. But could be the case that it, uh, it, it, uh, uh, that it doesn't happen and for instance, each box share with the uh, the other yeah, share with the other box some kind of <coughs> classical information like a list of rules, saying, for instance, that okay, whenever the box number one, uh, the for instance, Alice pushes the button, the orange button here on box number one. Uh, Bob will roll a dice, and depending of the number that face up, he will press the, this pink button here, and so on and so forth. So there is a classical uh, information shared among all these boxes, and when this is the case, the, this big probability here, it's nothing but some kind of expected value that breaks down into this product here that looks like this, car, this, this guy here, but now we are summing up over all hidden, summing up over this hidden variable space. So in this, even in this case in which there is this uh, um, shared information amongst the boxes, we can kind of separate or split these boxes into some kind of product and that's the reason why we call, we say that, that this behavior is local because we can kind of localize uh, the probability coming from box number one and box number two, so on and so forth, until box number n. So, and the last one is the quantum set. And we say that the probability distribution, or this behavior, sorry, belongs to the quantum set when you can uh, <coughs> write down this big probability using the Born rule, okay? So, and this is the relationship amongst all the sets. We have here as the outmost set, the non synonym set, and way inside in this sandwich, we have the local set, and here in the middle, we have the quantum set. We know for sure that, non that the non-signaling set is a convex polytope, so it is well described by it vertice, its vertices. And the local set as well is a convex polytope, no matter the scenario, no matter the, I mean, the values of the capital N, the little uh, m, and little v. And, but here in the middle, we have the quantum set, and the only thing that we know about it is that he's a convex set, and that's it. <clears throat> and for sure, the thing, the object that we are interested in is each facet of the local set. I mean, again, once again, the local set is a convex polytope, and as such, it is described either by its vertices or its facets. And for each facet, a tight facet, I would say, we call this facet as a bell inequality, but it's nothing but a hyperplane in a hyper in a higher dimensional space. So and in order to see is since it is a hyperplane, it, it divides the space into two halves. And you can say that a point here, for instance, belongs or doesn't belong to the quantum set because this facet here describes or divides the space into two halves. So and this is, since it is a hyperplane and nothing beyond that, we can describe this facet by this sum here, which is the hyperplane equation, and that's it. And we say, for instance, that if, you, if we take a point here, and this is the equation describing this hyperplane, we say that <coughs> this point here violates this bound inequality, or violates a bound inequality, or is not a local point, if 
if I substitute the coordinates of this point here, it it turns it turns it turns out that <coughs> within the substitution we get this equation with the order sign here is greater than delta in this sense in this case. So and in our case we have to look for this quantum version, which means that we will use this function here to say if a point belongs or does not belong to the quantum set. It, it's nothing than the Born rule. And this is our main question. Okay, given a typical pure state psi, oh, okay, let me, s let me say that now we have, if you remembered of the theorem, we have the Q function here and those this strange B here as well. So, okay, we're getting there. And given a typical pure state psi composed by capital N, d dimensional quantum systems, what should be, what should one expect for its largest possible violation over all relevant Bell inequalities in a given scenario? Because the thing is, we know for sure that the higher the local dimension is, uh, I mean, it's, the probability to find an uh, entangled state, if I pick a, if I, I mean, if I have a soup of pure states, for instance, and I pick at random a quantum states from this soup, the probability to find an entangled, entangled state, the probability that these entangled states that I pick up from the soup, that I pick up from the soup is gonna be entangled, it's like one. Almost all, all pure states in a higher dimensional set system is entangled. Okay, and the higher the dimension is, we know that this is this entangled state is going to be almost maximally entangled. So randomly, the chance, the probability to get a maximally entangled state grows as the n or as the d, the dimensional, the dimension of the local system grows, get bigger. So with probability one, higher dimensional states are highly entangled. And then you can say, okay, uh, maybe if we learned something from CUH, CUHSH that we know that the uh, maximally entangled states violate maximally CHSH, so maybe in this scenario, uh, these <coughs> typical pure states, as they are high, high entangled, they will violate maximally Bell inequalities, and this is the reason why I'm taking this sub here and this sub here. The first one I am optimizing over all uh, facets or coefficients, but of these hyperplanes, hyperplanes. But here I'm or I'm I'm optimizing over all facets, and this second sub here I am optimizing over all POVMs. So now I have this V, and I'm going to measure the degree of violation by this delta here. The greater the violation is, the bigger is this delta, or vice versa. And now I can go back to the theorem, and I hope that now we have all the in all information in order to, I mean, uh, in order to appreciate, let's say, this theorem, of course no, but yeah, the thing is that now given a scenario, and this D here is the local dimension, so, and then I'm using the higher measure in order to pick randomly unit vectors, so it's for pure states our result, the probability to find a violation which is greater than C, you can say, you can imagine that this is greater than delta plus one, it's just a techni technicality, you can get rid of it. So the probability to find a violation is lesser than or equal this ugly number here, but the most important part is this su super exponential behavior here, e to the minus, d to the n here. So this is the most important part of this upper bound. And using this upper bound, we have two consequences that you call quantum to classical. The first one, quantum to classical transition, and the first one is the following. It's just a corollary 
from this theorem, from this ugly theorem, and which the first one is if the local dimension, this little d, of uh, n partite quantum system satisfies satisfies this upper bound that we we don't know how to interpret this upper bound. It's just a some something that we needed in order to prove or in order to get this first consequence, this corollary. So if the local dimension d of an n partite quantum system satisfies this upper bound, then for large n, the vast majority of pure states will not violate any Bell inequality with reasonable coefficients to any significant degree. So the probability to find a state violating a Bell inequality by any significant amount goes to zero. And the second consequence is if the number of parts is greater than two, here I fixed, I kept fixed uh, the number, uh, the local dimension, and I said something about large n's. And here I'm keeping fixed <coughs> the number of parts, and I'm varying uh, the d, the local dimension, so, okay, keeping fixed the number of parts, and if the number of parts is greater than two, <coughs> as the local dimension d goes to infinity, we also have the same behavior, which means that the vast majority of pure states will not viol violate any Bell inequality with reasonable coefficients to any significant degree. And by here, I mean significant coefficients is that, or reasonable coefficients, sorry, it is this little b here lost in the middle of this, this soup of letters. Uh, it's just, this little b here is just the maximum coefficient in a Bell inequality. And by here, by reasonable coefficients, we say that this b here has to be lesser than or equal the maximum between mv to the n or and exponential of d to the n. So if the, if the coefficients of a Bell inequality are not super ultra big or large, so our results will be valid. And that's it. Any questions? Um, about these uh, reasonable coefficients, so uh, do you know if, it, if you're left in behind a lot of inequalities when you demand this condition? Do you well, we, we ask a lot of people like Adam, Planet, and Matt Leifer, and they don't know about Bell inequalities with super high coefficients that we would break down our results. Certainly, the the inequalities that we use, they are inside the the set. So, but I would like to know if you have an example or no. Mm -mm. Okay. I have a question. <laughs> so about this b, is it that it's setting the classical value of the inequality? Can I think about that, like that? What do you mean by set? Like uh, I could multiply everything by ten, and then. Oh no 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 no! We, we are we are kind of normalizing our inequality. Mm -hmm. This greater than one is because we are dividing by the classical bound to the to the quantum bound. Okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. To prevent this kind of of cheating. Oh. Um, so just to clarify, are you when you say a Bell inequality, are you talking about a facet? A or facet, no, a facet, a facet. So you don't allow anything that just partitions. Mm -hmm. Just a facet, yeah, okay. a, a tight Bell inequality, I'll say. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, just a very quick question because I'm a bit confused. Is this good news or bad news? <laughs> oh no, it it. Do, it Okay, great question, actually, I don't know. But I would say that it shows that there is this, I mean, we are kind of reinventing the, the wheel. 
in the way that we are showing that there is a huge difference between entanglement and non-locality at the end of the day. Your state could be super ultra entangled, but it, does, it won't violate a bone equality by a significant amount. So it, it, at the end of the day, it is non-local, or it's almost local. Mm -hmm. Uh, more questions? Yes. So uh, on the bad news side, so does this directly apply to like unfeasibility or like, difficulty of um, uh, implementing multipartite device independent uh, protocols? because you, you don't have bad inequalities to verify or it's very difficult to, to verify the violation? <coughs> well, well, remember that at least for our first consequence, you have, you have this upper bound here. So if you use qubits, you're fine. Mm, yeah. And do you know what I mean? And here, uh, this other one, if you keep the number of parts greater than two, but I mean, it's a kind of asymptotic result. So if you use not, I mean, you have the, you have the, if your local dimension is not that big, you're fine as well, you're good. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, not a super, it's not a bad news at all. Okay. Okay, any more questions? All right, so let's thank Cristiano again and...